Hi folks, today's topic is about hypokalemia, a condition characterized by high levels of potassium in the blood. So let's get started. But first, let's take a look at our usual medical mnemonic. So in the management of hyperkalemia, there are three important strategies you want to use. The first one, which is very crucial, is to stabilize the cardiac membrane. Then you're going to do interventions that will shape the potassiums into the cells. After that, that is going to be followed by dialysis. You would also have to identify the cause of the hyperkalemia and treat. So imagine a patient with hyperkalemia who has a lot of potassiums in the blood. And here we have a cardiac cell. Now, you're going to do interventions that is going to drive the potassiums into the cardiac cell. Okay, and you recall that if potassium goes into the cells, that can lead to action potentials, that can lead to problems with repolarization of ventricular action potentials, and this can lead to arrhythmias and, of course, death of the patient. You don't want this. So, you want to prepare the cardiac membrane, you want to stabilize the membrane prior to pushing the potassiums into the cells. This is going to be followed by dialysis because in hyperkalemia, which is severe, all the interventions by stabilizing the cardiac membrane, by pushing the potassiums into the cells, you're only doing that to buy time. So at some point, you would still need dialysis if it is a severe hyperkalemia. Then after that, you would like to find the cause and treat. All right, so it doesn't really matter which exams you are writing. If there is a patient with severe hyperkalemia and you are asked what is the initial treatment of choice, your answer is going to be to use calcium carbonate or calcium gluconate to stabilize the cardiac membrane before any other intervention. 10% 10 ml bolus, which may be repeated in 5 minutes depending on the trace on the ECG. You must do well to inform the renal team as well as the intensive care team. So what I have here is an action potential of the ventricle. We have phase four, which is the resting membrane potential. And then phase zero, where there is a rapid influx of sodiums. Sodium in, we have phase one, which is potassiums out, as well as chlorides are also going out. And so phase one is this slight decline over there. This is phase one. Then we can have the plateau phase. That is calcium comes in and potassium go out. All right. Now this part is very important, which is called the repolarization phase. And in repolarization, you can see that the potassium are also moving out. Now, if I should trace this on an ECG, we're going to have something like this. This is a P wave. All right, this is a Q wave. Then this is the R wave. Then we have the S wave. Okay, and you can see this. So then I have the T wave starting right there. All right, so if I should trace this step, that is the beginning of the repolarization phase, this is how it goes. It comes down. Right? And you can see that it starts at the beginning of the T wave. So in hyperkalemia, we would have problems with T wave initially, such as a tall tented T wave or a peaked T wave, which would look something like this, okay? So this can be a T wave, which is peaked or tented. Now, as it progresses, it leads to the P wave. So here, if I should draw another P wave, all right, like this, then you then proceed to the P wave. And here you can have a prolonged PR interval. Okay, you can even have absence of P wave. P wave may even be absent. And so as you see, it's easy to uh, remember by understanding that it starts from the T wave, then, then you proceed to the P wave, and so you may have 
things like PR prolongation or absence of P wave. Then eventually this is going to move to the QRS complex, which may then become widened and then it can lead to something called sine wave or a ventricular fibrillation and eventually an AC solid, for example. Some few things that I want to add is that remember that if you want to administer calcium carbonate together with bicarbonates, remember that's going to precipitate so you don't do that, you don't put them together. Secondly, calcium salts can also cause necrosis in tissue, so you must be careful. All right, you've been able to stabilize the cardiac membrane and that's a great job. The next thing is to shift the potassium into the cells and we can do that by giving X rapid, which is a regular insulin. So we can administer 10 units of insulin into 50 male, 50% 50 dextrose. Well, the patient has a risk of hypoglycemia. It is very important that you monitor the glucose levels, say every four hourly. That will be a good practice. All right. Now, this whole thing can be repeated, but you must be careful because if you have a patient with hyperkalemia and there is a lot of potassium in the blood, right? What happens is that you are going to drive the potassium into the cells by giving them insulin. So if you take the patients for dialysis, what happens is that the dialysis is rather going to remove the potassium that are in the blood, okay? So if you push the potassium into the cells, the dialysis will not remove a lot of the potassiums, and this can lead to what we call a post-dialysis rebound hyperkalemia. So you must be very careful if you're repeating the insulin doses quite a lot. Moreover, this intervention will lead to a reduction in the potassiums by, you know, around say one millimole. All right, and this may last for about six hours. So as you can see, this is not a definitive treatment for the patient with hyperkalemia. At some point, the patient with severe hyperkalemia is still going to need dialysis. Beta adrenergic agonists may be used in combination with insulin. When beta 2 receptors are activated, it stimulates the sodium potassium ATPase. Similarly, insulin through its receptors also stimulates the sodium potassium ATPase. This leads to more potassiums being picked up by the cells, and this can help in the management of hyperkalemia. This may reduce the potassiums by averagely around 0.6 millimoles this is also not very substantial hence a patient with severe hyperkalemia may need dialysis at some point agents that are to be used may include salbutamol or albuterol now in the case of a reduced bicarbonate below 18 then this may be replaced very slowly dialysis Patients with severe or refractory hyperkalemia need to undergo dialysis as medications alone may not reduce the potassium levels adequately and do well to recheck the potassium levels, especially if the clinical picture does not match the high potassium levels to avoid treating a pseudo hyperkalemia. In the treatment of mild to moderate hyperkalemia, resin such as calcium polystyrene sulfonate or kaoxalate may be used. Loop diuretics as well as tyrosides may also help support the excretion of potassium from the kidneys. Oral bicarbonates may also be used if the bicarbonate levels are below 22. Dietary recommendations must also be strictly followed. Thank you and I hope this was useful. If you enjoyed it, then hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Bye.